Hello, this is Michael Zenkota of Georgetown University, joined by my colleague, Professor Charles Skuba, also of Georgetown University. And it's a pleasure to welcome you on another segment of our show, Thoughts on International Business, Marketing, and Strategy. Today we're going to be talking about increasing government involvement in international business and the repercussions of that involvement both for corporate ethics and for corporate performance in general and what it also means for us as consumers. And the key example we're going to be using uh, today is the issue of Google and China and of course, how could one not, we're going to be talking a little bit about Goldman Sachs. So there we are, and our colleague, Professor Skuba, will lead us into what he thinks with Google and intellectual property and government involvement. That's a big, big serving you've got on your plate. Well, thank you, Michael. Yes. Uh, uh, Google, the, the subject of Google in China, when they decided to stop uh, complying with Chinese government uh, requests to have them censor information, um, it, it's something that captivated my students. And I've had several student reports on this issue. I've been very impressed by the level of interest of my students and by, uh, I think, their sagacity in uh, looking at the situation. Essentially, Google made a decision to stop censoring information, to stop complying, in effect, with the great firewall of China. Uh, Google went back to their corporate philosophy of providing access to information among their, for their customers. And that is what is fundamental to what Google believes is the right thing to do. In fact, if you look at their corporate philosophy, they say you can do good, you, you can do business without doing evil. And Google essentially believed that cutting off uh, access to good information among their customers was in effect doing evil. So they made the decision to sacrifice revenue and market share, which I believe was estimated somewhere in the 20 to 30 percent range in China, to go back to their core principles. Was this a good business decision, Michael? Well, I, I think what we have here is, of course, a classic situation uh, of national sovereignty clashing with corporate sovereignty, with what management wants to do. And, and it's nowadays uh, happening more and more frequently that governmental borders clash with borderless corporations. A company really has, in most instances, very little use for either arbitrarily or historically drawn borders. A company is much more, especially a company like Google, is very much cross-border oriented. Uh, now governments have particular issues they are sensitive on, they, they have government regulations on, and in the past government just issued directives, but nowadays with mass communication, one-on-one -on -one communication at the same time, uh, it becomes much more sensitive to, to and difficult to enforce things like that. You know, the issue, just so we're all on the same page, uh, for example, Google finds that the Chinese government uh, censors uh, output if somebody puts into its search engine the word Tiananmen Square, which was, of course, the, the uh, big social upheaval of, of the decade uh, in the last century, uh, in, the, in the second half of the last century for, for China. Or Dalai Lama, you put that in, you are censored. Now, the question is, should government have the right to do that? Or should individuals, and therefore companies as well, be able to say, no, we believe people ought to hear about the Dalai Lama or see about Tiananmen Square, and therefore we forge forward. So it's, it's a classic conflict. and. I really think it would make sense to consider something along the sunshine notion that if you can't stop government, and often you can, then at least communicate what government is doing. So here are the 50 words China doesn't let us tell you about. And I think that in itself is 
a, a uh, valiant activity, sunshine like that, uh, is a good disinfectant for governmental restrictions. You know, that makes perfect sense to me. I think uh, the more companies, and increasingly in this world today of social media, where companies need to be very straightforward with their consumers, it is probably useful to have a good sunshine policy. Uh, Google, not unlike most foreign companies doing business in China, went into China with the fundamental understanding that they had to comply with the way the Chinese government wants to do business. Um, McDonald's, when they were denied the right to buy their fruit juice, or pardon me, their, their yes, their fruit juice uh, uh, acquisition target in 2009, nodded, complied, said, yes, China, we understand, uh, we, will, uh, we would like to do this, but now we must move forward. Most US companies, most foreign companies, recognize that the Chinese government is going to have relatively strict regulations on what they can or can't do. That's the fundamental problem that affects most foreign companies, is that the government is heavily involved in business. Uh, and not only the Chinese government, other governments as well. You know, I'm noticing, it used to be that when I heard about visitors to the United States, they would all, in the business area, they would go to New York, and then maybe if they have some time, they'd go in Washington. And that is changing. People are now coming to Washington as part of their business entry, their business policy strategies, because they know they need to communicate with the U.S. government. Uh, and in general, only to wrap up the, the issue of information, I think as we have this freedom of information flow, there is, of course, also a danger of biases, of dirty information, inappropriate information. And I think it makes sense to have more source linkage, just like in a butcher shop. Uh, increasingly, butchers tell you this cattle comes from farmer Brown 10 miles away. Uh, it's important, I think, to also let us know this information comes from so-and-so. Because as we see it right now in the Goldman Sachs controversy, uh, who knew what, when, and how were they using it is a big issue and will probably drive a lot of societal concerns. What do you think about the Goldman Sachs situation? Well, I believe that uh, CEO Lloyd Blankfein uh, would prefer to come to Washington as a tourist rather than to testify before the Senate. It's certainly not one of those uh, visits that one looks forward to, particularly as the Senate, the senators uh, took advantage of the situation to really excoriate uh, him and, uh, in, in this case, fabulous fab, I believe, his associate at Goldman. Uh, because how many votes does Goldman have when there's a public that is furious at the financial industry? It's a bit unfortunate uh, that uh, we can't have a better understanding. This is a very complex issue. When you get into synthetic collateralized debt obligations, most senators don't understand the business that Goldman is in. Essentially, Goldman, as other investment banks, are in the business of providing capital to companies, investors that need it, and then mitigating risk. Uh, in the long run, what happened in this whole situation was that the extension of the risk became further and further extended away from uh, the, where the risk originated. Uh, senators have a difficult time. But that this is not going away, Michael. We're going to see more and more on uh, government involvement in the investment banking and banking business. You're absolutely right, Charlie. And, and I think in our show, we'll come back to the topic of Goldman Sachs uh, again and again. Uh, I, I should mention that uh, as partial response to our earlier show on doubling or tripling exports, uh, I have provided testimony to the House Committee on Small Business on the 28th of April, which will be posted on my blog site if you're interested in what, what we have to say.